Thank you very much, and thanks very much to the organizers. Uh, I'm also one of these people that has bumped into Bill Reinhardt uh, around the planet, and uh, so my introduction to him was in an energy forum in China in the fall where I discovered that if you want to move through Beijing Airport at the fastest poss possible speed, travel with Bill. He can put his hand on a brick wall and a magic door opens and suddenly you're through immigration. Uh, so he's a great guy to move around the world with. I'm gonna be providing a, a somewhat high speed primer on the role really of this recent revolution in the biological sciences and how this recent revolution will have a role to play in the bioenergy uh, sector. Now, really, Probably eight or nine years ago, the most interaction that biologists had with the energy sector was really how hot their Bunsen burner was. Uh, and that has dramatically changed. And a lot of the tools of the biotechnology industry that have been developed for pharmaceuticals are now being deployed uh, in the bioenergy area. And so what I want to do is give you a sense of the intersection between issues that we're facing in agriculture and agricultural biotechnology with energy along with this biological revolution that uh, many of us are participating in. Now, we just heard from Peter um, the typical kind of comments uh, regarding corn ethanol, which uh, I would say I completely agree with. But the one thing that does concern me a little bit in the press is that one tends to see the phrase good biofuel versus bad biofuel. And the way that I prefer to view it is, is to really think about the decision space that is created in terms of looking at what a particular biological solution as it relates to transportation fuels, how does it fit in? And I think that space is defined, of course, by three axes. One is economics, and we've heard a lot about the growth in global energy demand and the limits on crude oil just now and also in the talk this morning. The environmental axis, of course, relating to food production, water use, and climate change. And, of course, energy security in the United States and elsewhere. And so, for example, if you look at corn ethanol along the energy security axis, it would score very well in the sense it's extremely hard for someone to bomb 45 million acres of corn that are being used to produce ethanol uh, in this country right now out of a total crop of about 90 million. So we have to really think about how these axes define the space for which a particular bioenergy solution uh, is going to be applied and, and think about it within that space. And layered on top of all of this, of course, are economic development issues, jobs uh, at, at many different levels. Now, as a biologist, we're always thinking about timelines in, in human history um, and, and evolution of the human race, etc. And this graph, which I pulled off of a DOE site, is one that always amuses me because it, it basically puts into perspective hydrocarbon man's dalliance with pulling out fossilized algae, which is what crude oil is, um, and its use in our perspective. And it's just clear that um, our path as a population has been greatly influenced by this spike in utilization of oil, and we're clearly going to have to deal with the issues, as Peter's alluded to, of what happens when this stuff is gone. We've heard a little bit this morning about population models and population growth. At the low end of the predictions for the 2050 population are around 7.5 billion people. Um, other models will show as many as about 9 billion. We're probably on track for somewhere in between that. And this, of course, creates many issues that we have to face in agriculture, energy, as well as healthcare, because most of that growth, of course, is going to be driven from the developing world. And certainly from a viewpoint of thinking about biomass, the great challenge that this population growth creates is the fact that we're going to have to feed this number of people uh, really with a, a dramatically less arable land per capita. And so essentially 85% of future growth in food production is going to have to come from lands that are already in production because except for a few parts of the world, we really have very limited options for uh, land use expansion. And of course, we have to constantly think about environmental and sustainable ways of performing agriculture because agriculture itself can be an environmentally damaging process. 
So I'm not going to read all through these for the journalists that's in your package, but I think there are a couple of pointers about essentially a little bit of a perfect storm coming on its way that are generated by population growth and climate change. And population growth being associated, of course, with changes in consumption of calories. So as GDP rises, meat consumption dramatically rises, and that creates all kinds of uh, indirect effects on, on how we actually generate calories from sunlight through agriculture and feed people. But I think you can see from this that one of the key features to keep in mind here is that essentially food production is going to have to double to meet human needs by 2050. And in terms of uh, modern agriculture, we are slowing down the rate of growth in yield improvements. So now we are basically maxing out current applications of germplasm, inputs of fertilizer, et cetera, and agricultural production has now slowed down to less than 1% per year in terms of production increases. So we're going to need transformative changes in the agricultural sector alone to feed people. And then the obvious effect, of course, on this and thinking about the biofuels picture is the fact that we're going to really not be able to impact the production of food if we're going to use crops to, uh, to develop biofuels with. And really, the whole picture of this comes down to the intersection between the needs for human nutrition and, and food security, quantity, quality, cost delivery, land use issues, uh, the indirect impacts of biofuels in the sense that uh, a market for biofuels can create problems with indirect land use where people will chop down primary forest to grow a biofuels crop because of the value of that crop, and then the way in which we manage carbon. And so what we ultimately hope is that the solutions from a technology and, and socioeconomic point of view that we'll come up with need to hit this sweet spot in terms of balancing issues around nutrition, carbon management, and land use. So a lot of that is, is gloom and doom. Perhaps some of the brighter spots on this are the fact that there are energy sources that are available to us that are potentially sustainable. Uh, as a planet, our power use, the rate of energy use, is about 15 terawatts per year. And the amount of sunlight that actually hits our planet is about 86,000 terawatts, about half of which is photosynthetically active radiation. So you've heard this many times. There's plenty of energy there available from the sun, and the solar sector will talk to you about this as well. The big problem is, is that it's no simple feat to capture that solar energy and, and turn it into something useful. What has turned it into something useful is uh, a billion years of evolution on this planet in which photosynthetic processes in plants or in algae basically fix carbon and put that carbon into our uses in the sense of food production, fiber, or in the case of algae, a focus on, on fuels. And so what the modern biologist is interested in is this equation where obviously the fixation of atmospheric CO2 and the whole focus here is how can we direct carbon from the air instead of carbon from the land into our energy supply fixes that CO2 into a range of biological components which have different utility to us either in nutrition or for fuels. And so we want to be able to understand how these cells work so we can manipulate fundamental processes like photosynthesis, including a number of people in the advanced biofuel sector who don't even use photosynthesis. They use it to produce sugar, and then the sugar is fed to organisms in a fermentation process to produce designer fuels. So there's a lot of economic opportunities here in the advanced biofuel sector, for example, microbial biofuels, companies like Solazyme, Alice 9, and Amaris, where there are a number of, of economically interesting paths to take in terms of capturing photosynthetic energy either directly and turning it into things like sugar and using that sugar for a variety of different purposes not only for fuel molecules, but a whole range of bio-based chemicals. And it's that near-term revenue opportunity that's currently driving the uh, microbial or advanced biofuel space. The other driver for it is a revolution that's occurring in the life sciences. And if you can kind of hear some noise outside when you step outside today, 
Right here on the Torrey Pines Mesa, within a four-mile radius of where we're standing right now, are 29,000 people engaged in life science research. And they're engaged in life science research because we are going through a new biology revolution where we're beginning to treat biological systems in the same way that physicists and engineers treat their systems. And we're beginning to deploy computational biology approaches that allow us to generate simulations of how organisms work to the point that we can understand them well enough to actually start to create new traits within those organisms. And a lot of what has driven this revolution in biology is economics. And what's driven it is the cost of DNA sequencing, driven by local companies, for example, here in San Diego, like Illumina, where you can now sequence a genome of a complex organism for less than the price of a latte at LIX. And that ability to provide a parts list of the components of either human cells or microbial cells is revolutionizing the way we think about biological systems. So take a Prius. If we were to give you the parts list of a Prius, you could somewhat assemble bits and pieces of this Prius. I think this is a good analogy. And, uh, but you wouldn't be able to completely understand how it works without your engineers computationally modeling how some of these parts might work together. And that's exactly what the modern biologist has to do. They take a genome sequence and they, they view that genome sequence as a parts list and model then in computers how those parts work together to narrow down the number of experiments that we do to figure out how cells work. And so our view of cells, although they're frighteningly complex, and we're now having to use all kinds of amazing 3D graphics to view the inner workings of a cell, we are coming out with some functioning principles. And that is that biology, like computer science, is modular. And that the way we might construct a synthetic microbe, where we want a number of characteristics to be plugged into a fuel molecule, are very similar to the way in which, for example, the software engineering paradigm, where you have a number of data transformation modules that are combined together to give you the desired effect. So we have a number of technological revolutions going on that define these part lists. And the implication of this revolution is basically the path from concept to product is now much clearer and of much lower risk because of our ability to apply, to apply simulations to biological dynamics and situations. So the synthetic biology paradigm has a number of inputs from the new biology that I talked about, things like being able to remodel the metabolism of a cell. And the implications of this in, in companies like Alice 9, Amaris, in, in national labs around the country and university labs is we really are at the point now where one can begin to seriously think about creating designer fuels agreed in a very small amount at this, at this current moment. Scalability is, is a whole separate issue that has to be faced. But you can begin to dial in favorable uh, components of these molecules to be talking to the fuel chemists about what these biofuels should look like and begin to create essentially designer bugs that, that can make these. So that's one way in which we can capture this biological revolution. The other, actually, is to look at what nature has done for us. And here in San Diego, we have a, a large cluster of people who are really interested in participating, not interested, are actively participating in a new algae industry, which involves microbiology, agriculture, chemistry, engineering. And it takes advantage of this fact that many microalgae species naturally produce oils, and these oils can undergo simple chemical transformation to things that look like diesel, to things that look like petroleum, or things that look like jet fuel. And there are a great deal of challenges associated with harnessing algae biology to produce fuels, and those challenges really center around scalability. Cost productivity is a major one. That's essentially going to be an engineering problem how sustainable the whole life cycle is of this, and the idea that we can produce fungible or drop-in fuels from algae and microbes that can go immediately to be blended or into the full fuel change. 